joy and rest in the knowledge of this. And bless us now as we turn to your word. Encourage us, Spirit, to build up your church. And may we be the people you call us to be. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts, we're going to return to Acts chapter 2. Fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, and 
and which has at its root the meaning of that sharing something in common. So at the heart of the Christian experience is this idea that we share things in common with one another. As Christians, we share things in common. And, and of course, that's the life of being a church, right? And so on Wednesday nights, we've been going through, you know, who is Trinity? And we've been talking about what does it mean to be a Baptist church and talking about certain beliefs that we share in common. And so we talk about baptism, we talk about congregationalism, we talk about elders and, and deacons. This past week we talked about um, being a confessional church. And all these things are, are beliefs that we share in common with one another. But there's more that we share than that, right? Well, yeah, and, and it describes it here again in verses 42 through 47. What, what does it tell us that believers share in common with one another when they have gathered together as a fellowship. They share with one another a devotion to the scriptures. Verse 42. They share with one, or one another. I'm going to have this overarching theme of time. We share time with one another. And what do we do with that time with one another? Well, we share time set aside for prayer. We share time set aside for worship and praising the Lord. We share time set aside for having meals with one another. We also share with one another common possessions. We share our joy with one another. We share the common experience of seeing God working in our midst. And we share the enjoyment of finding favor among all and it's amazing how much work churches put into crafting strategies for, for becoming the church that God has created us to be. You know, what, what should we do? Who should we be when, when it's all written out here? And I'm not saying churches ought not have strategies. We, we need to have strategies because you would hope that these things would come natural to us. But it, it doesn't. It takes a lot of work. But we don't have to go searching for the target. God has given it to us here in his word. This is a strategy, if you will, for a vibrant church life. But it's not just that. It's a strategy for evangelism. This is an evangelism strategy. You know, when we think about evangelism, a lot of Christians just automatically think that evangelism is is an individualistic thing. It's, it's what you do after we leave the church and uh, building. We go out into the highways and byways and work and school and all these things. We look for opportunities as an individual to share our faith. And that's true. And the Bible does encourage that. But there's also a corporate nature to evangelism that the Bible holds up before us. And we see it here in verses 42 through 47. And we can see that at the end. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. This is what the church is doing. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. How were they hearing the message of Christ? What were they doing? They were seeing the fellowship of the church. And it had a magnetic quality to it. Are you all familiar with the, the story of St. Patrick? Have you ever read St. Patrick's story? If you haven't, he wrote an autobiography about his life, and you can find it online. I printed it out years ago and, and read it um, because we've got some Irish blood in us, and so I found him fascinating. And it ran about 40 pages, quick read, but it's fascinating. And you know that uh, Patrick was not an Irishman, he was an Englishman, and he was an Englishman who had been taken into slavery in Ireland. He was a slave to Irish nomadic tribal people. And that's what Ireland was at the time. It was a pagan nation of tribes of people who would move around with their sheep. And they had taken Patrick captive and had him as a shepherd for their sheep. And while in Ireland, Patrick becomes a believer. And God makes a way for him to escape his owners and make his way back to England. And it's, it's a super, super cool story um, how this happens. But he gets back to England just to make this short. He gets back to England, and while he's in England, he has a, a dream. And it was the call of the Irish. It was someone from Ireland beckoning him to come back to Ireland to share the message of Christ.
Christ with him. And so that he determined to do, uh, much to the dismay of his parents who pleaded with him not to go. He said, I've got to go. I need, they need to know Christ. And so he went back to Ireland. And what was his evangelism strategy? Well, he took with him a small group of believers. And they would go up to a, one of these tribes, and they would find the, the chief, and they would say to him, would you mind if we would come alongside your settlement, because they would settle a place for an extended period of time, and, and let us set up camp right outside of your settlement and just dwell here um, next to you. And the chief would give them permission, and then they would just live there, living out in their lives in Christian fellowship, openly praising the Lord, worshiping talking of his word, and then it's living in service to one another, communing with one another, and one by one is inevitable that people from that tribe would start popping into their settlement, going, what's going on here? This is something unlike anything I've ever seen. And it would open up doors for them then to share the gospel. And eventually that whole tribe would become believers, and then once he had a tribe full of Christian believers, he would maybe leave one of his group behind there to, to minister, and then he would move on to the next one and start all over again. And that was a strategy because he knew that there was a magnetic quality to people living in true Christian fellowship. It's as, I think it was Mark Dever, I heard use this phrase first, that the, the church is God's evangelism strategy. And that's what we see here in verses 42 to 47. So what does this strategy look like? The strategy of, of a vibrant church life, what does God's evangelism strategy look like? Well, we find it here in these words. So in verse 42, we see they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. You know, the apostles, uh, they, were, they were shown to be men of God, uh, men sent by God to spread his word. It uh, says in verse 43 that many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles, which affirmed who they were. Uh, Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, that the things that mark an apostle signs, wonders, and miracles were done among you with great perseverance. And that's what was taking place. And so they had the mark that God had um, blessed them and called them and approved of what they were saying. And so the people devoted themselves to their teaching. And in order for us as a church to follow this model is, of course, to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, the teaching that has been handed down to us in the scriptures. And the thing, you know, we're talking about here, let's not lose sight of this. Like today I asked two weeks ago if any of you had ever been asked by someone, are you a spirit-filled believer? Or do you go to a spirit-filled church? Well, let's not forget what, what the background of this is. The spirit has come upon God's people. They begin to proclaim his gospel, the the, the People are gathered in mass, and now here they are vibrantly living out their, their life of fellowship. This, this is what a spirit-filled church looks like. And so if we have these things happening, and someone asks you, do you go to a spirit-filled church, and what do you got to do? Really? Yeah, you know, we devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching, just like a spirit-filled church ought to. Now, I know that this has been something that has been a strong suit at Trinity, so I'm not going to belabor this point because we have many more to go. I know I'm going to run out of time. But we can't lose sight of it. It's not to, to say that it is not of preeminent importance. We need to be people of the Word. People who study the Word. People who speak of the Word. People who have the Word mixed into our conversations with one another are able to say, what have you been reading this past week? Or someone who is struggling, let me encourage you by this word from the Lord Amen. that I just read this past week, or that has been of comfort to me. I don't know how many times um, I've had people come by my office at work and I find myself grabbing my Bible and flipping to Romans 8.28 and just talking about God's working in every circumstance for the good of his not for this verse, I don't, I don't know what I would do, because I have found myself in situations much like these, time and time and time again. But I'm able to stand in the middle of that confidence that God is going to work this, even this, out for good. 
That says that should mark us as a people. That these are the type of com conversations that are happening. We need to be a church devoted to the apostles. Secondly, we need to be devoted to, as Peter puts it, the fellowship in verse 42. And I'm just using that as an umbrella term for what's going to come after. Just being devoted to the fellowship, I'm going to define that as being devoted to spending time with one another. I don't, I don't know where this came from. I know I must have read it somewhere, but I used to say this all the time, that love is a four-letter word spelled T-I-M-E. And what I would mean by that is you can't claim to, to really love someone unless you're spending time with that person. Or if you want to come to the point in which you really are enjoying love with someone, then you need to spend time with someone. That's the way it works. And based upon that simple criteria and the other things that we see written in this passage, it becomes obvious that most churches severely misuse the word fellowship. Because we describe every little thing as fellowship. You know, you've got a room full of strangers, in essence, coming together for an hour each week and then going home, and we call it fellowship. Or you might get together uh, once every blue moon if there's a certain uh, issue that has arisen. Hey, I just need somebody to talk to. Well, I spent time in fellowship with you. The fellowship is much deeper than this. Fellowship is not just casual acquaintances, spending a little bit of time with one another. It's central to what it means to be a church and to be brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, I've had so many students, believers who have asked me, Doug, what do you make of the idea of choosing where I move to after graduation based upon the church that I want to attend? What a great question. Now, I'm always impressed if I hear that. Like, boy, oh, you're a lot more mature than I was at your age. But I say, if you've got a choice, if you've got a, multiple job offers that you can choose any place, yes. I said, go look at each area and find which area has a good, solid church. And then that's the place you choose. And then when you go to choose a place to live, find a place that is near that church. Because you have to spend time with those people. That's what fellowship is. Now I know sometimes that's impossible. Sometimes you, you, you are away from the church building by a distance. And I know that even the small group we have here, we come from all kinds of different areas. But that's where we really need to think as a church. How do we shorten the distance between one another so that time can really be spent? And that's where I think it's just crucial uh, for churches to be thinking about. How do we get into one another's homes? And of course, that's what's coming up here soon. But what do they spend time doing? And forgive me for taking these things a little bit out of order. It's my it's the way my brain works for some reason. I didn't even notice I was doing it out of order until I was done. <laughs> but what did they spend time doing? They spent time in prayer. Spent time in prayer. Verse 42. In the verse 42. There was a quote that I had written down um, that I came across. I don't know who said this. I wish I did. My, my suspicion is maybe it's Spurgeon, but I'm not sure. But it says, there exists not a more undoubted evidence of a renewed nature, a renewed nature, than prayer. The absence of it is the unmistakable evidence of death. And as soon as I read that again, it brought me to mind of uh, me as a kid watching my grandmother who lived on a farm um, cutting the head off the chicken to prepare that chicken for dinner. And if you've ever seen a chicken's head cut off, you know where the phrase you're running around like a chicken with its head cut off comes from. Because as soon as that head went off, boy, that, that, uh, that body, <laughs> it, it 
took off running. You don't have a good grip on that thing, which my grandmother did not. I remember this just so vividly. That thing just took off, and it's running all over the place. This headless chicken. And it's a kid. You're like, what in the world? But you're watching it. What you're looking at is something that seems, it's giving evidence that it's got life. But really, all it, that was was this the spasmatic muscle movements of this body that does not realize that it's disconnected from its head. It's really dead because its head is gone. Now, in the church, who is our head? Our head is Christ. How do we stay connected? But through prayer. And how many churches are there out there which are very active? And if you look upon them, you would think, oh, look at that evidence of how much life that church has. But in all actuality, it's actually disconnected from the dead. And all you're saying is action, but no truth. Fellowship ought to be a fellowship of prayer. If there's ever a thought that ought to convict us about the need for prayer, it's just a meditation on how pleasing it is to the Lord. If you look at Revelation 5 8, you have this picture of heaven before the throne of bowl are bowls of incense. And we're told that those bowls of incense are the prayers of the saints. Well, what's incense? Verse 47, it says that they spent time together praising God. Now it seems obvious that that ought to be what a church does. We get together to praise God. But it's worth taking a look at ourselves and asking ourselves whether that's the case or not. You know, Mark Lloyd Jones made, it, made an observation. He said, you know, the devil can counterfeit most of the things that we read here. You know, he People can look like they're devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching when, in fact, they don't really believe at all what they're saying. He can even counterfeit prayers. People just mumbling words, unthinkingly, and it looks like prayer, but it's not really anything. But he says the one thing that the devil cannot counterfeit is praising God. Amen. And the reason he does not counterfeit praising God is because he hates does not want to see the praises of his name being lifted up. And so we come together as a body and we, we, we sing songs of praise with one another, but don't you think it's much more than that? I mean, even the, if you look at the context of verse 47, it doesn't say they were singing praise to God. They're just praising God. How often are we doing that? How often do we talk with one another about you know, how good has God been to me? How great is, is our Lord? That ought to be something that we're saying to one another with regularity. And we would find that if we did, what would follow is great joy and fulfillment and satisfaction. What is it that C.S. Lewis says about praise? He says, well, why, why do we praise? When we, when we hear a song and we love it and we just, we're not satisfied with just enjoying it ourselves. We want to share it with somebody else. you got to hear this song. Why do we do that? Why do we praise that song to somebody else? To see a movie. you got to go see this movie. Why do we, why do we care if, if somebody goes and sees the movie that we enjoy? Well, C.S. Lewis says because praising completes the joy 
Like I can, I can enjoy the song and just love it, but the, the completion of that joy is me going, now that I've enjoyed it, I want you to enjoy it. And there's a real satisfaction that comes with that. And so he, he, he says this and, and um, pushing back against those that say, you know, God is a God who, who commands people to praise him. Oh, how narcissistic of this God to do that. See, as Lewis says, you're missing the whole thing. His command to praise him is actually a gift given to his people. Because if we were not outwardly praising his name to one another, our joy would not be complete. It's in the praising that the joy is finally complete. And joy, joy, joy comes in the midst of that praise. And so we need to ask ourselves, how often do we hear the praises of God in this place? And just each of these things, we ought to have a mental checklist. You know, when's the last time that I've done that? How, how natural is that for me? In reality, these things do take work. To work into our habits. That's why I said at the beginning, most people have a strategy because it does take work. You know, I've talked to people who, who praise the Lord and you know, have said, you know, Doug, our experience in, say, the church in Blacksburg, and I said, what, what a great experience. It was so, so encouraging me. It just felt like family as soon as I walked in the door. I praise the Lord for that, but then I said, you don't understand how much work that took to create family. You'd, you'd hope to be as natural as falling out of a tree. It's very easy to fall out of a tree. But, but it, it's not. Because, you, again, you've got to spend time. So that means that you, you've got to intentionally set aside. Things. But then, once you're together, what are you doing? You can't just sit around and stare at the walls. You've got to intentionally go, okay, now what does it look like to spend valuable time with one another? How do I encourage each of these, uh, these, these folks I'm with? What are the words I'm saying? How, how do I enjoy them. I've got to work at that. And then after a while it becomes natural. So you don't even think about it because you've worked it into the way that you, you're living out this point in you. And so we need to be thinking through this. How often do we praise the Lord for one another? What else were they doing? They were sharing meals with one another. We are told in verse 42 they were um, devoted to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread. And then again in verse 46, day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. Receiving food with glad and generous hearts. Now, now some people point to this and, and say this is the observation of the Lord's Supper. And it may be. Um, but, but there's no real indication that's necessary what it's just talking about. It looks like it's just talking about how they were folks who and meals with one another. And I am a big proponent of this. Not just because I like to eat, which I do, but because I love community. <clears throat> and I love fellowship. I love seeing brothers and sisters enjoying each other's company and bonding alongside one another. And few activities enable this, like sharing a meal. There's few activities, like sharing a meal, that really demonstrate hospitality to one another, whether you're showing hospitality in your own home or even in, in the church building. We, the times of fellowship meals in the fellowship hall is a time where we can show hospitality to one another by bringing food, but just the way that we interact with one another. And hospitality, which I really think is the core of what it's getting to, because hospitality is something the Bible just over and over and over beats that drum. How important is this? And unfortunately, it gets a uh, uh, it gets a short a short shrift. Is that the word? Sound like that can mean whatever you want. It gets neglected. We treat we treat it as if it's it's not it's it's low on a totem pole in terms of the important things that the church is about. Boy, does that go contrary to what the scriptures say. Just a few examples. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 3, when you're looking at uh, the description of an elder, he 
It says that an elder must be hospitable. And it's only after saying that does it say that he must be able to teach. First Timothy 3. It's saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-control, respectable, hospitable, and then able to teach. You would think able to teach would be the first thing out of his lips. But it's not. It comes after being hospitable. I mean, we don't want to make too much of that, but it certainly does tell us something about the importance of hospitality. I remember in my, our first church, we had, I got into a row with um, one of the elders in, in that church. We, we had a couple elders, and each of them were hosting a small group in their home, we're calling them small groups, or home groups, whatever it was, where we wrote time in the Word. And, and I, as we were beginning that, I told them, here's what you're going to do. You're going to host it in your house, and you're going to begin with a meal. And then after the meal, you're going to spend time in the Word. And one of them um, said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have time for that meal stuff. I just want to get into the, the meat of the Word. I mean, it sounded real pious and everything. And I said, uh, no, you're going to have a meal. <laughs> and then you'll, then you'll open up the Word. Okay, fine. Well, I'll just give them bread and water. You know? And I said, dude, you will be having dinner with your people. That's, 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 that's the way it's going to go. Why? Because, he, I mean, he, his calling was to be hospitable. <laughs> but this is what it looks like to fellowship. Break bread with people in your homes. You flip just the, well, I don't know, flip it all the same page, chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. You've got the description of uh, the older women um, who that a widow been enrolled in the uh, uh, the roles of those who will receive help from the church. What are the marks of those who would do this? It would be those who are shown to have been hospitable. Romans chapter 12. We go there and we've got this description that most of us are familiar with that passage because we know this is the passage that talks about Presenting our bodies as living sacrifices unto the Lord. And what does that description include? It says that we are to devote ourselves to, to God. We are to serve our brothers and sisters. But then it says, starting in verse 9, it gives us a list of marks of a true Christian. That love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Constant prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. And this is all one thought of Paul's. And so it seems that the implication is you want to know what it looks like to live a life that you could call a living sacrifice up to the Lord, offer up to the Lord, show hospitality. That's part of the call upon you. And then finally, 1 Peter 4. 
So it's not just sharing food. We're back to Acts. It's a willingness to share everything. Verses 44 through 45. All who believed, Acts chapter 2, all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, I, I, maybe you've heard people say, look, the early church was a communist uh, uh, compound or something like this. You know, I've seen billboards before. You, say, you know Jesus was a communist. Um, but that's not what's being pictured here. I mean, people weren't selling everything they had and putting the money in a pool. Um, I mean, they were meeting in one another's homes. I mean, they, they owned houses and rooms that they could meet in. And, and when we get to the story of Ananias and Sapphira, um, they were told, hey, that land, that was yours to do with what you, you wanted. You didn't have to sell it and then lie to us about what you did with the, the money. But it's simply the fact that when they gathered, nobody had to worry about going without there was such a love and a fellowship among them that if I knew you needed something, I was going to do my best to get that for you, even if it meant selling my own stuff in order to get that for you. And like hospitality, I mean, I think they see things go hand in hand. And what a powerful witness this is. I mean, what is that saying to one another? And what is this saying to the world? It's showing how loosely we hold on to earthly things. That we are not tied down to the world and its goods. We, we are pilgrims here, right? This is not my final home. This stuff, what is it to me? I can't take it with me as it were. This is just stuff. I hold on to it loosely. I freely give. And, and after all, it, it, God gave it to me in the first place. It's not mine. I've been called to be a steward of this. And so I am willing to give. Um, I would talk about this often about it, there being a ministry of borrowing. Now, if you have a need, a lot of us are so hesitant to ask. I'm not going to ask you for something. I'm, I'm a self-made man. I'm going to do right. Take care of myself. I don't need to lean on anybody. Show me weakness. someone to be able to give to you. That's, that's a blessing to them. To be able to be obedient to this. When we resist asking, we are hindering this. Because if needs aren't known, then people aren't meeting one another's needs. And so, in the context of true fellowship, through this openness of saying, hey, I, I really do need help. And then the church can say, Glad to help you with that. It's my joy to do this. But it needs to be in a fellowship. And it's also a great opportunity to witness even to your non believing neighbors. You go over to your neighbor, I know this is different, it's kind of like a tangent free thing. If you need to borrow a ladder, you don't have a ladder, say to your neighbor, hey, can I borrow your ladder? Wow, I'm not going to do that. Well, why not? Just return it to them better than you got it. But what's it do? It creates an opportunity to engage with your neighbor. And then talk to them when you return. Then later go, hey, you know what? Should I borrow your hand? Yeah, by the way, what's going on? How's, how's life? Man, I'm hurting. Well, I got something for that. I got some words for that. The ministry of borrowing.
this the crooked generation's form of happiness is temporal passing, dependent on circumstances, is dependent upon having possessions or money or on other people. If they deny that, well, as soon as those things are gone, what are, what, where did happiness go? They went right out the window. But the Christian's gladness is independent of its circumstances because it's rooted in our relationship, our unchanging relationship with our unchanging God. And so it is not dependent and so that's why the Christians could face persecution and yet be saying rituals. Paul could be in chains saying rituals. Again, I say rituals. There was um, a study I read some time ago uh, by a guy who was just looking at churches that seemed to be vibrant and growing and all this kind of stuff. Certainly it was one of these church growth related things, but it's a really interesting study. And, and one that he was marking that each of these churches had certain things in Bible teaching and small groups, things like that. But he made a comment in there that really stuck out to me. He said, one thing that surprised me, the author, to the point of almost making this a, a mark, was that all of these churches had a lot of laughter. He said, if you look at them, there was a lot of laughter. Well, now he's not talking about it in the service. He's not talking about the you know, holy laughter. So he's just saying there was joy in that church. That when people laughed at one another, that was a mark. Just think about that. When you're laughing with one another, what is that? Your walls are down. You're, you're open with, with one another. And that's always been something that I strive to, to work in in the church. You know, it's, it's a joy. Let's have fun with one another. Not just be great, but let's have fun with one another. It's not like I'm having fun. So quickly, the shared scene, the work of God. All wonders and signs, all came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. In verse 43. Now we don't have apostles doing wonders and signs today. Does that mean that God isn't still working? You'd be forgiven, perhaps, to think that maybe He isn't, because we don't talk that often about it, do we? Well, I'm not saying that's here, but in the average church, much like how in the average church you're not going to hear a lot of people praising God, the average church you're not hearing a lot of people saying, "Hey, would you believe what God has been doing in my life?" Hey, what's God doing in your life? That ought to be part of our conversation. What has, been, what has God been up to this past week in your life? Tell me about the wonders of God's word in your life. You know, there's a lot of people who are discouraged. They feel distant from God. They feel like God doesn't even know they're there. They need to hear stories about God. God still works. Let me tell you about what God's seen. And this all leads to sharing favor, and that's, that's where I started with. This is not just a strategy, quote unquote, for a lively church. This is God's evangelism strategy. As they lived this fellowship out, people came to faith. God was adding to their number. Again, it makes me think of them having being filled with gladness. Can you imagine God adding people to their number if they were a bunch of sour faces or grumbling? 